pictures. Um, so today we're going to talk about um, Alana's book, which is uh, female morphology, which you also call uh, new artistic anatomy. And this is the first time Alana and I have talked. Um, many of you probably have this book, Artistic Anatomy. And I've been looking at this book for 15, 20 years now. It also comes in the hardcover. Um, and then it was only recently that, I think it was around Christmas time this year, 2020, I got uh, Alana's book and I really found um, this to fill in a lot of gaps for where I was in my personal development. Um, so maybe before we talk about the book, could you just tell us a little bit about your artistic training and um, maybe what inspired you to, to do this translation? Sure, of course. Uh, I went to Brown University for my undergrad. I studied both biology and museum studies there. And after that, I uh, took a little time and then went to the New York Academy to do an MFA there. I uh, studied painting and anatomy at the New York Academy. I was so fortunate to have some amazing instructors there. Uh, Dean Keller uh, was there. We were so lucky to be in his final class. We didn't know it at the time, but it turned out to be his last class that he taught. And he was really a special person. And it was an honor to study wow. with him. Uh, and also Edward Schmidt and uh, Stephen Assel, Vincent Desiderio, who are all there at the same time. And we were so fortunate to learn from all of them. Uh, I met Eric Manella there and we got married a couple of years after, uh, moved to Montreal together and started our atelier here. And we've been teaching and working together ever since. And uh, so I have a foundation in drawing and painting and a strong interest in anatomy with a little bit of background in sciences. Um, so I really, uh, I really got excited about Richet's text when I read it because it has elements of, of several things that I find uh, very interesting and I thought would be helpful for other artists. <laughs> so it's sort of a natural fit for you. Um, you felt a connection with Richet, it seems. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, he's an inspiring individual. Uh, I don't know much about his biography, unfortunately. I haven't found yet any reference that uh, really discusses his personal life or his uh, personal working habits, but there are a few photos of him working in the studio all throughout his life. He wrote about a dozen texts on, on a wide range of subjects. And this one in particular on female morphology, I find to be very well researched and very comprehensive and also quite distinct from the Hale uh, translation, which you had showed initially. Um, Riche wrote this book around 1890 when he was about 40, 41 years old. And this is an amazing book. It's got a wonderful explanation of the structural aspects of the body, uh, the skeletal system, the muscular system, origins and insertions of every important muscle uh, that uh, operate the human body, um, as well as some discussion of morphology and uh, soft tissues in the book. But there's very little about the female form in that book and Richet spent a couple more decades researching and compiling his text on the female form. Uh, he published his female morphology in 1920 when he was in his 70s. So wow. that gives you a sense of kind of the difference in time uh, and in personal research that went into this second book. Uh -huh. And it looks like photography was coming, becoming more a part of his uh, research. Definitely. He was interested in photography from the beginning. Uh, he was born in 1849. So even by that time, by the time of his birth, photography was becoming commonplace and it, it would have been easy for artists to have access to photographs and printed uh, photos. Um, he did a number of photographic experiments with another French artist, uh, Albert Lone, uh, who created a series of kind of motion capture cameras. Uh, he built these systems where he would mount like nine or 12 cameras in a board and fire them sequentially to give movement sequences. So he would have some uh, walk across, uh, 
a, a platform and take a series of images of them, much like Moybridge, uh, he, he, uh, to analyze the movement and the, um, the, the action of that person moving through space. So Richet was interested in photographs uh, quite early on. He also had an amazing sculptural sense. You know, sometimes people think of artists who use photographs as you know, maybe lacking something or lacking some ability to draw or construct the form, but that certainly was not true in Richet's case. Uh, he um, was a first-rate sculptor. And you can see several of his pieces in the Musée d'Orsay. He exhibited in the Salon uh, several times throughout his career. And sculpture was really at the heart of, uh, of his artistic practice. That's one of the things I find so amazing about him. And um, I know we're both teachers and you probably get doctors in your classes as I do. Um, and it's so rare that someone would be a physician and a sculptor and a draftsman um, and a brilliant writer and teacher. So it's, it's just, um, it's so impressive when you, when you really think about the guy. And, you know, on the cover, you have one of his, I guess, um, what would you call this? This is probably his, his a culmination of his, his work and his life, maybe. Um, and you can see he's quite, quite um, aesthetically in tune and, and very sensitive and very artistic for a doctor. Um, so I guess my question is, now this book, tell us, you know, tell us kind of what it is. Is this exactly how he wrote it or was this a series of smaller books or, um, you know, what, what is this book for someone who's just tuning in? Good question. So uh, in this first uh, 1890 edition, we have uh, Artistic Anatomy. Uh, this first book was published as a series of plates uh, and a separate text, which are combined together in this volume uh, and translated to English by Robert Beverly Hale. Um, so Richet followed up Artistic Anatomy with a six volume series of books called New Artistic Anatomy. And he wrote uh -huh. the first volume on the male figure, which, which basically takes from this book. There's nothing radically different in it. It, it uh, sort of combines some information from his previous artistic anatomy with a few other uh, sort of superficial uh, ideas of the body, meaning superficial in view, not in, in depth. Um, so his female morphology was the second uh, in that six volume series. And then he had a third volume on uh, postures and movements, and then three final volumes on the history of the nude figure in various uh, artistic periods. So basically an art historical analysis uh, of the nude uh, in, in art. And does this, does this contain all of those? Uh, no, this is only the second volume. So this is the oh, second wow. volume uh, specializing in female form also with reference to male forms, uh, uh, he, Riche stated in his preface that he felt this was uh, essentially the complete work on morphology for both genders um, because it contains information on both male and female uh, structure. Okay. Uh, and what is, for our, for our viewers, what is morphology versus anatomy? Let's talk about that. That's in question, you know, we all tend to think now about, you know, when we learn the structure of the body, we, we think of it as anatomy, uh, and it is. Um, but morphology is sort of a counterpart to anatomy that, that deserves uh, to be understood as well. Uh, anatomy is, is uh, an age old practice of study for a long period of time. Anatomy and medicine, so artistic training and medical training, were, were similar. And artists would seek to dissect the cadaver much as, uh, as physicians would uh, in order to learn about the structures of the body. Uh, anatomy comes, the word anatomy in English comes from the Greek word, uh, which means I cut up uh, anatomios. So I, I uh -huh. dissect, basically, I cut up a, a form to understand it from the inside. Um, so Richet, seems to take that to mean that anatomy is something that is sort of a unifying factor among people. Our anatomy is, is more or less the same. I, I won't say the same, but, but 
fundamentally the same among all people. So it, it's something that brings us together. Um, we have a bone structure that's designed to meet certain physical requirements. We have muscles that attach from one specific place to another on our skeleton in order to move it in specific ways. Um, so these are the aspects of anatomy that are common among, among most people. Uh, but morphology instead is a, structure, a, a study of form. Uh, it's, it's the study of forms within the body. So the anatomy of the figure becomes a starting point for that. And then you start to consider sort of relationships of volume or proportion, uh, specific ways in which perhaps the pelvis is different in one individual than in another. Uh, some of that relates to gender. There are certainly differences that tend to be characteristic of male form and others uh, that tend to be characteristic of female form, as well as sort of intermediate forms uh, that have elements of, of either uh, extreme. But um, all in all, morphology deals with how those anatomical features are represented in the totality of the individual. Uh, so how the forms are assembled and how they appear uh, from the outside. And one way Riche presents this information is by establishing sort of two extremes with a continuum between them. Uh, so he gives us sort of vocabulary to describe two separate ideas uh, within the body and then once you're aware of these things, you can go into them and be more precise in the way that you understand the form. Uh, I can put up the, an example that I found to be one of the most interesting aspects of this book. This is an illustration of the pelvis. Um, does that come through? Oh yeah. Okay, so here we have a pelvis that, sorry, I just have to find it on my screen here. We have a male and a female view of, uh, of the pelvis. So in two different configurations. So in the top, so, so the figures on the left, obviously male, A and B, C and D, female. However, the top two images, A and C, represent a version of the pelvis in which the two iliac crests are kind of straightened up and face each other a bit more. Uh, Richet calls this a closed pelvis. And then B and D, one male and one female, represent the more open pelvis in which the iliac crests are slightly wider spread, uh, creating different surface forms uh, that you may recognize. You know, after you know some time drawing the live model, you see, you know, different people, different physiques, and, you know, maybe you recognize some of these differences, but, but you're not aware as an artist of how they originate. So this particular example in the book was so informative to me. I, I, I was really, um, I, I think his information on the pelvis is really unique uh, and was very helpful to me. And again, filled in some gaps in my understanding of the figure uh, that uh, had, had been there for a long time. So uh, this is something you may find interesting. Um, the whole region of the groin is, is rather different. The, the triangular shape in between uh, that inguinal ligament from the ASIS down to the pubis versus the crease um, of the thigh, you know, those are very different shapes. And in English, we, we don't have a lot of vocabulary to describe organic shapes, right? We can liken them to a geometric shape. But you know, how do you describe a, a shape, a component of the human figure? It's difficult. Um, so by understanding these, these extremes uh, of form and then looking for sort of intermediate forms between them, uh, you can become more sensitive to the structures that you observe from the live model. Yeah, that's a really good example of uh, the types of diagrams in the book. Mm -hmm. um, and there are numerous ones like this mm -hmm. that talk about different types. Um, and it was something that I come from, my background is portrait painting, mm -hmm. and then I got into sculpting. Mm -hmm. And my teacher was Cedric Egley, still my teacher. He's about 85 years old now. Oh, but he would oftentimes talk about body types and um, 
you know, it, it got down to not just your proportions, but how did people move? You know, how do they sit? Are they flexible? Are they stiff? Are they, um, you know, like a little bird perched on the chair? Are they like a stocky bull? You know, and it was, it was sort of um, what I think Sergeant may have talked about it, or maybe people uh, put these words in Sergeant's mouth that, that his paintings were like an advanced caricature of, of the person and the paintings look more like the person than the person. If you can wrap your mind around that. I think we all know what that means um, on a visceral level that he's kind of getting to the concentrated essence of a person's character, you know. Um, so that's, you know, that, that's really important. And um, I'm sure you tell your students similar things that as I do that it's, you know, you can't just learn anatomy. And I remember my sculpture teacher, Steve Perkins, would say, sometimes when you learn anatomy, your, your work goes downhill because you, you have no idea how to organize it. Um, it's so the gross, it's yeah. It at times, it's true. And sometimes it becomes sort of a convention that you pull out uh, again and again. You start, you know, representing a hand the same way or the shoulder uh, the same way. But, uh, you know, through a process of observation and sort of uniting those conceptual ideas of the body with observation of the form, uh, hopefully you can come out in a place where the anatomy serves your artistic purpose. Yeah, and I found that the morphology for me, because because geometry has played a huge role in my work and teaching, and, and I, I can see relationships between planar geometry and morphology, although it's not strictly the same. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's that's a, a topic that can really help um, the art student organize gross anatomy into something useful, mm -hmm. along with proportion and plane and uh, rhythms and, of course, learning about the action of the pose, um, you know, the direction, etc. Um, so, yeah, that's a, that's one of the things that attracted me to this book. Excellent. Um, where else can we go here? So, so I saw in the book, he's called the, the father of modern artistic anatomy. Um, can you explain that a little bit? Why is he unique in this time period? Sure, uh, that's a good question. And that relates to this book. Um, I think this book has, has a lot to do with that. Uh, so we all know that for the majority of the history of anatomical study, the male body has been used as the standard reference for, for numerous reasons, uh, probably uh, partially to do with the fact that there were sociological societal taboos around the female form, uh, around studying the female form. Also that the anatomy is more clearly dis displayed on an average male physique than it is on an average female physique. So perhaps it's easier to comprehend from the surface of the body. Um, it was common for anatomists to write texts for the purposes of artists. Uh, Richet's teacher, Matthias Duval, wrote a text which Richet probably learned from. Uh, this is here. Uh, this is his um, uh, title is Précis d'anatomie artistique. Um, uh -huh. so this is his sort of condensed um, treatise on artistic anatomy, which covers primarily the male form. Um, it, there are very few plates in this one. It, it's primarily text. And uh, I'll see if I can find an illustration for you. There, there are not very many. Um, here's one on the pelvis. So uh, this again is Duval, who was Richet's teacher at the Ecole it's the pelvis, and nice. some shape ideas, sort of uh, constructions. Of and did he illustrate it too? He did, yeah. These are his wow. illustrations. So Duval was the chair of artistic anatomy at the Ecole uh, before Richet. Richet took over from Duval when uh, Duval retired. Um, so Duval wrote this text on the male figure. Richet followed up with his own version of that in, in 1890. Uh, and Richet's approach is rather different though. He, I, I would say that his first work on artistic anatomy is a little more conventional. He wasn't really breaking the mold there. Um, 
but his approach was a bit more progressive than those that came before, partially because he was relying less on sort of an antique ideal of what the human body ought to look like. And mm. he was taking more of an anthropological approach in taking measurements from dozens of models and compiling them statistically into a set of average proportions. So Riche is really not aiming to represent an ideal form in his, in his texts. He's aiming to represent a range of, of healthy human forms. Um, which makes him distinct from earlier teachers who were interested in, in uh, giving their students exemplary forms, uh, you know, who the, the philosophy was that students ought to copy the antique and learn about proportion and rhythm and, and harmony within the human body from antique sculpture and then apply that onto their studies of the live model. And Riche now is taking the live model, the, the human individual as his standard and measuring dozens of individuals, taking the same data points from dozens of people and compiling that to arrive at an average form that represents the majority of people. Okay. Wow. Yeah. And the, the amount of uh, charts and um, measurements in the book is immense. Um, that takes a while to get through. It's, uh, you know, that's, that's worth going back to a few times. I haven't done it yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's okay. You don't start there. It's at the start of the book. But, uh, you yeah. don't have to begin with that. But it's interesting, though. The other reason why I feel his uh, female morphology really deserves to be known now and deserves to be read again is that, again, he's not using this text to describe what an ideal female body ought to look like. Huh. He, is instead presenting a range of different physiques and uh, trying to help the artist train their own eye and their own observation to be sensitive to these variations in form. When he discusses proportion in female morphology, he looks at the female figure from a small, like a petite size, an average size, and a large size. So right away, he's, he's taking into account a range of physique uh, within the female form. Which is wonderful. I think if he if he hadn't taken that approach, this might not be so relevant or so helpful for artists working today. Yeah, well, I can certainly see the the, uh, uh, the shift. The shift. Well, there's an echo, echo. Uh, between like neoclassical art and then perhaps like the nineteenth, later nineteenth century, twentieth century. Uh, can, is there a parallel there? I mean, between how people's minds were changing. Most likely, uh, Riche was active through uh, the, his artistic career kind of um, was active through the mid 1870s through about 1930. Uh, uh -huh. And that was a period of such fundamental change in the world. You know, the, he lived through the, the golden age, the end of 19th century art. He had his training in the 1860s, late 1860s, he would have been a student at the Ecole. Um, he had his medical training through the 1870s and became a medical doctor at age 30 in 1879. Um, and then he lived through the First World War. He was a director of artistic anatomy at the Ecole from 1903 until 1922, uh, during which time he published this book. And, you know, so much happened during yeah. that time uh, that uh, I think certainly he made a contribution to the training of artists from, you know, from his first work in 1890 through, uh, through the 1920s. So that alone represents a huge output in terms of his work as a teacher and an educator. It's amazing. You said there's not much known about his personal biography. Yeah. Is, did he have a family? We don't know. I have no idea. I've never found wow. reference to that. I would love to know. Uh, apparently, he was from Chartres, uh, outside of Paris, a medieval town with a beautiful cathedral. Um, wow. His family were cloth merchants there. Uh, he he references going to the Ecole in the preface of, of this book. So he would have received artistic training at the Ecole, again, in the mid-late 1860s. Um, but in terms of his personal life, I know very little. I'd, I'd love to know more. 
Yeah. I just can't imagine. Yeah. I just can't imagine he had a family. <laughs> I've never found a reference to that. And I don't think if he had, if he had had uh, a wife or kids, it would have been indicated somewhere. But um, yeah, it's a mystery. <laughs> yeah. I just can't get over uh, how much work he produced. Um, must have been an amazing work ethic. Yeah. I'll show you a couple uh, more images of, of, uh, of his work. Um, this is a maquette for Tres and Una, the sculpture that is on the cover. Uh, of oh, the I love that. Uh, yeah. This is in the Musée d'Orsay and uh -huh. it was made of around 1900, 1903. They didn't have a precise date on it, but apparently it was uh, known by 1903. Uh, and he completed the marble sculpture Trace in Una in 1913-14. So uh, 10 years of gestation and, and, uh, and planning uh, went into this piece. And here he's looking at these three figures, aiming to compose them in a statue that references the three graces. Um, and, and did he carve the final piece as well? I believe so. I believe mm -hmm. so. I, I can't say with complete certainty. Um, I know that it, it's possible that he uh, modeled it in plaster and the carving was made by an artisan, but I, I can't say for sure. I, I believe that he did carve that, but I, I can't say with complete certainty. And let's talk about each figure there, um, what they represent, and uh, maybe well, how that's that's related to his uh, belief system. Sure, I'll bring up the uh, the larger image of the full grouping here. Because I think a lot of times people see these these old sculptures and they just gloss over. Oh, another group of nudes, you know. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of thought, you know, ten years of thought and planning went into this. So let's. True. Let's give him some credit. It's true, definitely, definitely. Let's see, my image of this sculpture disappeared, so we'll okay. cover instead. Um, so this is a grouping of three figures, and in this sculpture, Roche aimed to show the kind of the evolution of the female form within different periods of artistic uh, time. Uh, the center figure aims to show a female form from antiquity. So she has a uh, kind of a, a, a straight uh, appearance. Her form is, is somewhat more balanced. Uh, Riche calls this like a square uh, physique. Uh, so more equality between the width of the, the rib cage and the width of the pelvis. Um, the figure on uh, on this side uh -huh. represents the female form in uh, in the Renaissance. So her form is more serpentine. Breasts are smaller. Hips are wider. Uh, pelvis is more open. And then the figure on the opposite side over here uh, aims to show a woman of Richet's contemporary time, so early 20th century. Uh, with a more naturalistic representation of of the body, um, so and then he added attributes for each figure that reinforce their uh, their period in time, sort of a Renaissance vase. There's a, a capital from a column behind the antique figure, um, and some flowers behind the the modern woman. I love that, you know, because at, at first glance, I just thought it was another you know, classical thing. And then you start looking at it and you, you start studying it. And, and I, I try to look at art, great artworks like a book. You have to read it. You gotta spend some time with it and um, give it the attention that the artist gave it. And sure enough, I, when you explain that, I can, I can see that. And I love that the, the Greek figures in the middle, um, you know, I know in my own work, like I always go back, I have to go back to the geometry of the Greeks because you know, without without that organization, the um, the gross anatomy is kind of useless. You know, yeah. <laughs> in a way, um, you know, you can't just you can't just download anatomy into your brain. You have to learn, you know, a little bit each month or year, and then 
eventually you have most of it, but, um, you know, I, I just want to put that out to our young artists and, and those who are studying, like, you can't learn it all at once, you know? Um, so maybe you can, can you talk about that a little bit? Like the, um, accumulative nature of, of this type of study and, and uh, uh, the time and energy it takes. Sure, yeah, I absolutely agree with you. I feel that um, for people who are serious in aiming to, to represent the body in a naturalistic way, it takes a period of time and it takes trial and error. Uh, it takes some drawing from life or from reference, drawing from exemplary sculptures, um, in order to understand proportion and form and in order to make use of some of the information in this text you have to have fairly solid drawing skills or, or sculpting skills whatever the the media is that you choose to work in so you have to be able to represent nuances and form uh, in order to, to to make use of this information um, and i agree i think your approach makes a lot of sense uh, trying to sort of take in everything at once and sort of re uh, just radically change the way that you approach the figure um, is not really the way to go here but taking in a bit at a time you know a bite at a time and and understanding it processing it and trying to integrate it into the way that you work uh, can be very helpful uh, and can you leave you open to different insights that come your way that, that you find in research or observation. I was reading about Roche and, and you mentioned that he, he ended the dissection tradition at the Ecole Beaux-Arts. Um, can, you, can you give us a little insight into that? Yeah, that's so interesting to me too because the Ecole had anatomical training present from the very beginning, from the 1640s, artists were learning anatomy there. And dissection had been a foundation practice there for centuries by the time Rouché assumed that role. Uh, but again, he was living in a time where medical training and artistic training were starting to diverge. And uh, his personal feeling seemed to be that it was more beneficial for the artist to focus on living anatomy, he called it, the anatomy of the living, rather than cadaver studies. Um, that perhaps you could learn about anatomy adequately by reading a text, by observing the action of muscles uh, and bone structure of the body. And it wasn't necessary for students to go spend hours in a cadaver lab uh, basically trying to reinvent the wheel. Uh, they could make use of what had been done before and learn from those sources rather than um, doing the work themselves and dissecting uh, bodies uh, in the cadaver. Yeah, because I don't, I don't know about you, but when I see a dead body, it's, it's not really the person, you know? I mean, it's, 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 it's interesting to look at the attachments and, and maybe how the, how the muscles are all you know, braided together. And, and then I, I sometimes find myself late at night looking at some cadavers on, uh, on Google, but, uh, but yeah, without the, the blood pressure, as my teacher called it, the, the force of life, um, you sort of lose what it's all about. So, you know, I thought that was an interesting uh, switch. That's part and, of what makes Richet's drawing so beautiful in my mind too. His drawings from artistic anatomy uh, are so lifelike, you know, they don't look mm -hmm. like they were made. Is a crochet drawings in here don't look uh, like Oh, you mean the actual a crochet, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're so beautiful and mm -hmm. they do have that force of life. You know, he knew the body well enough that he was able to, to bring that out um, and make the body, the body appear volumetric, you know. Yeah. So it's, you know, you do feel breath in that rib cage. You do feel volume in the muscles. And, you know, this is perhaps a better resource than looking at an actual cadaver, which lacks all of those elements, which is flat primarily, which loses important planar aspects uh, that we see in a living body. Um, yeah, I think so. And how did he do those drawings with a pen or? Yeah, these would have been done in pen and ink. Um, yeah. 
and they're they're beautiful. They're really nice. just amazing on, on gray paper with ink and white chalk, and they're 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 really lovely. Uh, the drawings in female morphology were done in a range of media. He said that he uh, didn't make one set of drawings uh, for this book. He sort of went through his drawings from years of accumulation and chose representative examples to illustrate uh, important concepts in that book. So uh, in artistic anatomy, we see diagrams expertly made uh, in a series, a complete statement. Uh, female morphology is a little looser. We see a lot of drawings from life, which we don't see in his first work. Um, but the, the totality is a little bit more varied and you get a sense more of who he was uh, as an artist uh, just by seeing his sketch process. Yeah, you can certainly feel that. Like there's, it's almost like there's clippings from his sketchbook in the book. Um, and then I also noticed some Edward Lanteri plates. Can you talk about how those got in there? Boucher included them in his original text. Uh, he and Lanteri, I, I think they're about 10 years apart in age. Lanteri was just a bit older than Richet. They both uh, studied with Gilles Dalou. Uh, and so they likely knew one another from his studio uh, before Lanteri moved to England. So Richet knew and respected Lanteri and included those diagrams in his female morphology to show uh, sort of flow lines through the body, uh, envelope lines uh, tracing through the contours of the body to represent volume and, and movement uh, within the painting. I love that because um, they're both kind of my heroes. And you say they had this, they had the same anatomy teacher. Is that? Uh, yeah, they both would have learned from Duval. Uh, Duval, who was the the teacher uh, from the uh, from the. I, I should check again when he began at the Ecole. I think he was there from the 1860s. He was there quite a while uh, and he ended in 1902. Okay. Yeah, because very few books talk about, we call them rhythms, mm -hmm. um, you know, like Lanteri does. And it was a big part of my training because Cedric Egley, my teacher, studied with um, Frank Riley mm -hmm. at the Art Students League. And that was a big part of Riley's training was the, uh, what, he, what became known as the Riley Lines. And I think there's a book by Ferragasso, who was a Riley student, and um, you can see all those those relationships he's making. And you know, I find that's another way for our, for our uh, art students listening to organize your anatomy is to relate it across, you know, from the head down to the foot. Mm -hmm. And certainly, if, if you're just looking at one muscle at a time in an ecroche way, you're not going to um, you're not going to create the poetry of the figure. So I, I love that Lanteri's blended in with Roche. And I just, I wasn't sure if you put him in or if Roche put him in. No, it's an all-star book. Um, no, I changed very little about his original text. As a translator, I felt the duty to represent his words faithfully. There were only a couple of aspects that I modified uh, for the interest of a contemporary reader but the vast majority of the text is his. So the words are primarily his. Wow. And so the book is female morphology. Is that, is that what you call it? Or do you call it new artistic anatomy? I, I call it female morphology. That was Richet's complete title though, new artistic anatomy, female morphology. So uh, I, I tend to emphasize female morphology because it gets to the point of things. Uh, but new artistic anatomy was important to Riche to distinguish it from his previous work on artistic anatomy. Okay, well, I highly recommend it. And, you know, as someone who's been teaching for a long time, it, I think it, it definitely fills in some more advanced problems. But I think, I mean, do you think uh, even a beginner could, could benefit from this book? Um, definitely, there are- the chapters? There are, some of the information is more complex within the book, but his drawings are so beautiful and so accessible and they're inspiring to see. Mm -hmm. um, I have, let's see if I can get one more here. Oh no, they all disappeared, I'm sorry. Um, okay, sorry, the one I had wanted to show. Uh, yeah, I reference him a lot. Um, just aesthetically, I find myself going back to Roche Mm -hmm. on a monthly basis you know if, if I'm not sure about something I'm going to check how he did it yeah yeah 
one that I the one that I had wanted to show is uh, is gone. But this book is interesting for that because it gives some beautiful views of the features of the face, uh, sketches of the eye in different positions. You know, things that are challenging for all of us and things that that artists grapple with. And here we can see Richet's solutions to these difficult questions. Um, so I, I do feel that this book is accessible to a range of readers from those who are just beginning or have a casual interest in drawing or sculpture to those who have been uh, researching these ideas for a long time. Yeah, and I think um, talking about the morphology makes it more relatable than just simply looking at a necrochet and then jumping into the life drawing class, you know, if you can, if you can see how Roche is relating the anatomy to the to the landmarks on the surface, then you have a, a much better chance at success. It's true. It's true. And in the female body, the egg crochet tells part of the story, but so much of it uh, is also told by the soft tissues, the arrangement yeah. not within the body, the the aspects of anatomy that do not come through in the egg crochet. So by taking this approach, by uniting uh, anatomical understanding of the form with surface forms, you can arrive at a more complete statement and uh, a, a, greater, a greater understanding, a greater representation of any given individual. Um, yeah, certainly the fat pads are going to vary from male to female. So yeah. I like that he you know, addresses those uh, those forms and even the creases, yeah. which, you know, um, a teacher might say, hey, don't worry about that yet. That's a detail. But you get to a point where you kind of want to know what's the difference between the line of the groin and, you know, uh, whatever, the line between, like you said, between the thigh and the and the and the crotch, you know, like <laughs> it seems like like splitting hairs, but actually uh, quite important landmarks. Yeah, it's true. And just understanding that they can be different in different people. Their expression looks different uh, for different individuals is helpful. Um, yeah. It's and if you're using, like a lot of artists use photographs and um, I know what happens with me. If, if I'm using a photograph and I'm not informed enough about what I'm looking at, sometimes I'll misread the form, you know, and you might, you might mistake a, an insertion for something else or one muscle for another. So um, I think it's a fabulous uh, text and I really recommend it. Um, you, you said there was a chapter on the effects of the corset to the female form. Yeah, that is one alteration I made in this book. Uh, Riche spent a good bit of ink in this book talking about how horrible the corset is for women's bodies. And just after this book would have been published, all of a sudden, nobody wanted to wear a corset anymore. Fashions changed after World War I, and, uh. and nothing was the same. Um, so that part of the text is, is a little less relevant today, I think. So I compiled all of that into an appendix at the end, because it's really interesting. He, he had strong feelings about it. He felt like corsets were very damaging uh, to the female body, that often they would distort and deform the rib cage so that the lower ribs are, are way too constricted and have a, a terrible effect on the internal organs of the body. Uh, so yeah, Riche was, was really adamant that women should not wear corsets. <laughs> he probably saw it in the models and maybe even in a dissection. I don't know. That's right. He said that sometimes uh, in dissection, women's bodies were so um, constricted that the ribs would leave imprints on the internal organs from the external <laughs> pressure of the corset, which, which just sounds atrocious. Um, yeah. So uh, we're lucky that, that things change and uh, nobody has to go through that anymore on a daily basis. <laughs> wow. Yeah, the things people do for, for uh, what's fashionable is uh, unbelievable. It's true, it's true. Um, now, what's now? Are you teaching? Uh, what are you doing these days? You're teaching online. You're teaching in person. Or tell tell the viewers what you got going on. We're teaching online right now. Uh, my husband Eric Manella is teaching a bunch of online courses in painting and drawing, uh, in anticipation of reopening our studio in Old Montreal. Uh, 
right now we're sort of dividing parenting and teaching duties all in the same house. So he's doing the online teaching. Uh, but as things open up again, we'll both be teaching uh, a range of classes uh, in the studio and online. And what's your website? Uh, we're at atelierdebresol.com uh, and I'm alanabenham.com. Okay, so we'll put that in the description. And um, yeah, I hope to get this on YouTube and uh, maybe Instagram. I'm running a page called Dead Sculptors on Instagram. And it's, yeah, it's I think it relates to our conversation here because, you know, you look at this era that Roche came out of and, uh, you know, it's just unbelievable how many amazing French sculptors there were, how many great Italian sculptors there were uh, all over Europe. Uh, I'm just finding new artists each day. And anytime I find a good one, I look, well, who did they study with? And then, oh, what a surprise. He studied with Delu or, or Carpo. And it's like, yeah. you know, so anytime you find something of quality, you got to trace the lineage. Um, That's true. I'll show you, you one more that, that does come up. Um, this is an amazing sculpture of Richet's. Uh, can you see that one? It's called The Race. It's coming, I think. Does that come up? It's it's thinking. <laughs> okay. Uh, Maybe try it again. Let's see, is it? Okay, let's see. Trying again. Um, so this is an image of two men running. Does that come up? I'm not seeing it, but you know, I think I know the sculpture you're talking about. Okay, all right. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. We'll go back here, uh, but... Um, yeah, it's an image of two men running in mid-stride. Uh, the sculpture itself is a reduction. It's about 18 inches in height, I think. And it, it's just amazing. This is a moment in time, a brief moment that no one could observe. You have to know it in order to mm -hmm. represent something like this. Um, I wish I could share it with you, but. Yeah, well, I, I think it's on my Dead Sculptors page. Um, right. So if, if you guys find, the post I did on Roche, there's a series of pictures. I think one of them might be that one. And I, one thing, I, one last thing I want to ask is, do you know how you taught mostly? Was it through drawing or sculpting or, you know, I, I always wonder, I wish I could be a fly on the wall in the, in the classroom I there. Me too, I would love to just devote a good period of time to researching uh, teaching methods at the Ecole. Uh, I know that drawing was the foundation. He he taught drawing specifically. Uh, okay. Time, so they would have spent about 18 hours a week on an individual drawing. Um, some of them were anatomical studies. I've seen a few journals and notebooks of students there uh, just um, compiling anatomical studies, uh, écorché drawings and drawings of the live model which are more rendered and more finished. But I would love to know more about how he emphasized uh, aspects of the body, how he encouraged students to analyze the form. Um, I, I would certainly love to be a fly on that wall myself. Yeah. And any star students that we would know that came out of his classes that uh, um, you know, maybe some famous painters or sculptors? Yeah, I can't say for sure. 1903 to 1922. Um, I, I can't say. I, I should know a few. Okay. So anyone during that time period at the Ecole? Yeah, would have studied with Richet. Okay. That's great. Yeah, yeah it's just fabulous. Um, I remember discovering that he was a sculptor one day. I go, oh my gosh. Yeah. I just didn't even know. Um, so the book is Female Morphology. And uh, today's conversation was with Alana uh, Benham. And um, check out the links below in the description. And what's the easiest way to get the book? Uh, it's available on Amazon. If you search okay. Paul Richet on Amazon, you will find it. OK, great. Well, thanks a lot. Um, I think it's almost been an hour. And uh, maybe we'll do this again sometime. Sounds great. It's a pleasure talking with you. <gasps> All right, thanks, Alana. Great, pleasure. <laughs>